Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about stress strain diagrams because these are fundamental to the study of mechanics of materials, um, but they're often misinterpreted by students when they're first introduced. So, what we're looking at here is two typical profiles for stress strain diagrams. On the left one here, we have just a typical profile of a ductile material, for example, that could be structural steel. And on the right here, we have a typical profile for a brittle material, which, for example, could be cast iron. Um, now, how this works is if you're taking mechanics of materials in university, part of your course will be going to the lab and seeing the testing apparatus. Uh, but basically what you do is you take a rod, uh, let's say for the structural steel, take a rod of structural steel, and you place it in this testing apparatus that will sort of slowly and incrementally apply more and more tensile force to it. And, uh, and then as it slowly applies more attention, the, uh, the computer basically spits out this graph and, and that's how you get the stress strain diagram. Now, when students hear that we're incrementally applying a load, an increasing tensile load, uh, then you, you kind of immediately jump to the conclusion that, well, uh, it's the load itself is the independent variable and the strain that's resulting is the dependent variable. And so we often jump to thinking, well, if we're applying a load which is independent, uh, then we look at this here and we see this stress, and we think that this stress must just be like the the incrementally, you know, the increasing load times the uh, times the cross-sectional area, making this the independent variable, and uh, making this the dependent. But that's like that's not how we draw graphs because we always draw the independent variable on this side and the dependent variable on this side. So don't jump to that conclusion. A lot of people do, uh, because that's not right. So what's really happening is when we're, uh, when we're uh, incrementally growing the, the tensile force or increasing the tensile force in the member, it's that applied force that's actually causing strain in the member. So when we increase the tension, we increase the strain, and that strain actually causes stresses to develop in the material. So these stresses here are not are is not just the uh, the force times the area the cross sectional the applied force times the cross sectional area. These are the internal stresses that are resulting from the strain, which is resulting from the applied load. So the strain in this sense is the independent variable, uh, and the internal stress in the member is the dependent variable which is uh, fully dependent on how much strain there is. So that's just a huge misconception that a lot of people get wrong when they first see these diagrams and I hope that I, uh, I, hope that I articulated that clearly enough. So let's focus in here on the first section of the graph uh, from zero up until uh, we reach sigma y here and this is the uh, sigma y here is the the yield stress. So if we load if we uh, apply some tension to this member uh, and we we get a, a corresponding strain that's going to result in less than this yield stress, if we if we stop loading it there and we unload it, all of the strains actually are going to disappear. Uh, so we basically have stretched out the material, and then as long as we don't pass this uh, this yield stress here, when we unload it the material is just going to like shrink back down or kind of rebound back to its original length and we call that we call that elastic behavior or elastic deformation and in this region Hooke's law applies and for those of you that uh, if that's new to you Hooke's law here is stress is equal to capital E here this is the modulus of elasticity times the uh, the strain so there's a linear relationship between stress and strain in this first section here so long as the material has not yielded. Now if we keep applying our tensile uh, our tensile force here and we get a strain that's going to cause us to uh, to reach this yield and then keep going or this yielding stress and then keep going what happens is in this region we uh, we get yielding and basically what's going on is we get extreme like a significant elongation of the member with actually very little extra applied load. So going back to this first section here where I said if we if we load the beam we're gonna follow this profile going up and uh, and up like that and if we unload it then we follow the exact same profile back down all the way to zero strain. Now if we load that if we apply this load such that we get a strain that takes us past this yielding stress or at least up to this yielding stress and we get yielding 
if we unload the, uh, the applied force in that region, uh, basically what it's going to do is it's going to start here the plot and uh, the plot kind of it, it adjusts, it'll shift over, it'll follow this same slope here but when we unload it the, uh, the, the stress strain profile actually goes down like this and it won't return to zero strain because I've said we've actually reached that, uh, we've reached the first part of our plastic deformation now and some of these strains will now be permanent. So if we, if we reduce the load down to zero, we'll get stuck with some of these strains and this plastic deformation. And then when we reload it again, now it's going to follow this, uh, this pattern here on the stress strain curve when we're applying that incremental, ten incremental uh, tensile loading. Now, if we keep applying even more of the loading in this testing apparatus, and we, uh, we make it so we have a strain that's actually taking us past this point, and uh, we're into this region now. Uh, we get this region and we call it strain hardening. So you can imagine if we, uh, if we loaded it uh, up until maybe here, and then when we go to unload, uh, we take off some of that, we're gonna get this, uh, this profile like this, and uh, when we unload the, the, the applied force on this member, the stress strain diagram falls back down to here and we're stuck with even more deformation than before. But then when we go to reload this member, we go up this way and we're actually, we've kind of created this region that will actually now sort of act elastically to the point where we come back to this amount of deformation, but we can actually uh, achieve a much higher internal stress that, uh, that actually approaches, we get closer to our ultimate stress. So if we push it even further, we, uh, we get to this last point, the top of our curve here, which is our ultimate stress. So the region where the curve was increasing again was called strain hardening. And if we apply a load which, is, which results in uh, this, this strain, which then results in us reaching our ultimate stress, that means we've applied our ultimate load to this particular member or specimen. And if we keep loading it past that, we'll get a thing that's called necking. And that is basically the member itself will start, uh, it'll start losing cross-sectional area and really stretching out. So it kind of starts, if we it's, if it started like this, which is a nice, you know, uh, uniform cross-section, it actually gets really weak in one area like this. Um, and uh, eventually we'll, uh, we'll come to this point and this is, uh, it'll snap and this is called uh, our uh, rupture, or sorry, breaking stress where the member will finally catastrophically fail. And if you remember from some of the previous videos, we were talking about the ultimate stress of a, of a material is either the point where it, uh, it breaks itself or where it loses the ability to, uh, to maintain that level of, uh, or to support that load. Uh, if, we, if we passed our ultimate load here and uh, kept going with the load and then we suddenly unload it, well, not suddenly, but if we unload it, we'll follow this profile back down. Uh, when, we un uh, when we unload the member, we'll follow this profile of the stress strain curve. And then when we come back up again, um, we're not, if we reloaded the member again, we're not even going to get to this point again before we uh, get closer to that breaking stress. Uh, so that's a little bit, uh, so that's kind of just like an introduction to how this, uh, how the stress strain curve looks for uh, for ductile materials and the different major regions of it, so the elastic deformation, yielding, strain hardening, and necking. And again, wanting to make sure that you guys get that we are applying that tensile force which causes the strain in the member, and that strain is what's causing this, uh, this internal stress here uh, as the dependent variable. So, um, the, so that, that was all for ductile, but for a, for a brittle material, it's actually quite a bit simpler. Um, we just, uh, we, ha we don't have all of the, the signs of yielding and necking, um, where uh, we'll just get a sudden break. When we apply a force that gives us the right amount of strain, that will be the ultimate stress, and it is also the same, the ultimate stress is the breaking stress. So we just get basically um, catastrophic failure without any warning. So that's just something to be to be wary of if you're designing something that's made out of cast iron or another brittle material, is you won't get the same warning signs as if it was made out of a ductile material. 
All right, so I hope that explanation helped you guys. Uh, it can be really frustrating if you uh, if you don't understand what is the dependent and independent variables in these graphs and where they come from and how they work. But uh, I hope that this explanation really helped, and uh, and then now we can move on with the rest of mechanics of materials.